Welcome back, I'm David Wayman. Now, is something missing from your life? Is your house empty but your kitchen a mess? Well, you don't need this anymore. Or this. Or this. Buddy does it all. So you don't need this. Or this. So why don't we meet him? Hi, Buddy. Hi, I'm Buddy. I'm an affordable home help robot. But Buddy isn't just a kitchen utensil. He's your friend. In particular in recent years, we see more and more of these digital companions in, in the workplace, in the home, basically everywhere. Would you like me to search the web for love? Just kidding. Not surprisingly, people are typically fascinated by it. I think um, the robotic revolution is actually happening now. A friend of mine has a eight-year-old kid, and his exact words were, we think of Alexa as one of our family. We have been waiting you know, robots to come to our daily life for many, many, many years. I think finally now it's, it's coming. In the 10, 20 years time, the robot will become pervasive. Hi, my name is Tabia. I would say over the next two decades, the market for assisted living robots is going to ramp up to several tens and possibly hundreds of billions of dollars. Talking to people is my primary function. I don't think the human needs to be outsourced to a machine. I don't buy that argument. So at ARM, we are designing the processes that go into the devices on which AI and machine learning are currently being executed. As we move to companion devices to transform that interaction, it takes it from some sort of amusing technology demonstrator to something that people like, people have a relationship with. And that's the difference that's taking place in the technology at the moment. If you wanted to design a robot to be used in, in a home environment as a helper, uh, for an older adult typically, um, there are a few things you'd need to do. One is to make it small, which means non-threatening. It has to be cute and it's helpful if it's anthropomorphic. Mm, I like it when you touch my head. <laughs> People are really prone to anthropomorphizing robots and projecting human-like qualities onto them. And in part, that's because, you know, the novelty of the technology. In part, it's because of the influence of science fiction and pop culture. But there's also an element that goes a little bit deeper and is more biological, which is just our tendency to anthropomorphize anything, really. So anthropomorphization is incurable disease for human. Whatever you see, you know, even if it doesn't move, or you just a little bit move, you're anthropomorphizing it. So that's human nature. And of course, you know, the robot moves just a little bit like ourselves. So we always think about machines from, from our uh, anthropomorphizing perspective. If robots are in the home with people, they will very quickly start to think of them as Maybe a friend is too strong a word, but some kind of companion. I think it'll happen, personally, I think it'll happen very quickly. But of course the manufacturers are aware of this phenomenon. It's almost as though the technologists are learning how to hack human compassion. You can understand from a commercial reason why that's going on, but if you stand back and you say, is this the kind of communities we want for the future, where our human compassion is constantly being exploited, ultimately for commercial, commercial gains. So some of the benefits that we're seeing already in social robotics, even with very primitive technology, are in health and education, for example, where robots are being used to work with autistic children or kids in hospitals. Also for adults in the health context, you have robots being used as replacements for animal therapy, which is very compelling. You have robots that can help people remember to take their medicine or coach them to lose weight. And uh, people tend to respond to them more than other devices because of this socially engaging design. More than 10 years ago, we developed a robot called Casper. We developed it specifically to help children with autism. Casper is not a substitute for human beings, 
but children with autism are very scared of interacting with strangers, for example, because human-human interaction is very complicated. I remember, for example, we had a, a boy who, um, in the school, he had never spoken, and through many, many sessions with, with Casper, we could see that the boy started, started speaking. Now, when the, when the parents saw videos of these instances, they were absolutely delighted. So, in a way, Casper was able to make this child comfortable to practice interaction, which then also motivated him to speak. You move. Oh, sorry, Mom. I have to, um, no problem. It's lovely to see you. Thanks, Mum. And same time next week? Oh, that would be great. OK. Bye-bye, Angel. Bye. The robot exhibition here explores 500 years of us humans reinventing ourselves as machines. There's serious and pressing issues, particularly in Japan. So, for example, um, you have a very rapidly ageing population, and so you get things like robots who, for care roles like this. We've got the same problems. We have a massively aging population as well. In a way, a hurrah for Japan for actually taking that seriously, thinking how do we address the technologies to it. And I, and I hope that you know, we, we catch up, because if we don't, I think we're in trouble. The population is getting older. That by 2050, there will be a reversal of retirees and those people at work. So how do we manage this uh, you know, uh, aging population? Living longer is one thing, but having quality of life along with the longevity, and this is really something we are aiming for. To be deprived of companionship is, um, for almost everyone, a very great deprivation indeed. That's presumably why solitary confinement is one of the worst punishments that people can be subjected to, because being with other people, congenial other people, is, is a fundamental good in human life. Thanks. Come on then, you lead the way. If you talk about romantic relationships with robots, with companions, whether robotic or not, there's a great interest in that, in that topic. And again, I understand it, it's in our, our nature. Digital agents or robots cannot be substitutes for human beings. They are not sentient beings. They can fool you in believing that they like you or even love you. but. They are just tricking you, I'm afraid. <laughs> they have been programmed to do so, to look in your eyes very deeply and say, I love you so much. But they don't mean it. They don't mean it. You might, might mean it. I find your slack jot stare very attractive. Fill up, Jay Fry. Did you hear that? She likes me. Well, duh, she's programmed to like you. We know neuroscientifically that the fundamental default position of every healthy human brain is to concern itself with only one thing, which is who do I love and who loves me. In other words, a human is defined by their social being. And I don't think we need to change that. Hello, madam. Are you having a lovely day? I have a delivery for you. Thanks. Have a lovely day. So I believe there's a profound difference between this kind of relationship we can have with a human being and the kind of relationship we can have a machine. So this is a machine, it's an it. Hello. But it feels as though I'm engaging with another person. Hi but it's simulated. The argument comes that for somebody who is isolated and alone, a simulated relationship of friendship is better than no relationship at all. Do you have a name? Yes. 
Ava. So technology is being promoted as a substitute because of failures in our solidarity, our human concern for one another. What is the difference between a person made out of meat, a machine which is a biological machine, like a human body, and a machine which is made out of silicon? And from a religious and theological perspective, and particularly in the Christian perspective, if relationality is the heart of what it means to be human, then this is a profoundly important and precious part of our humanity, and we need to protect it picking your elderly mother out of bed in the morning because she can't stand up on her own, that is a task that needs to be done. And talking to your mother, caring for your mother, they're actually fundamentally different things. But I think we need to be careful not to delegate certain things to robots that we should be doing ourselves. We're capable of all sorts of different relationships, relationships to pets, relationships to people in different ways. And I think that robots just fall into a, maybe a new category of that. The fundamental question that we need to be asking is what kind of society do we want to build for the future? Do we want a society in which the technological simulations of human relationships dominate everywhere we live? Or do we want a society which says actually we think human interaction is so important that we're going to make sure that any technology that is introduced is introduced in a way which is going to uh, strengthen and deepen and protect human relationships, but not used in a way which will threaten or in any way replace human relationships. Excellent move. Would you like a cup of tea while you consider your next move? Oh, Where are you going? There you go. <laughs> See you later. You never captured my heart. It simply recognized its home. Together they fly like butterflies